All righty. Um, I think we're going to get started. We may still have some people trickling uh, in. Uh, my name is Jarrett Dieterly. Uh, I am a resident senior fellow uh, here at the R Street Institute. Uh, we're hosting uh, this event today. We're really excited about it. Uh, we've had a lot of interest in it, um, and uh, it should be uh, it should be a fun event. Um, uh, we're going to, at the end, uh, answer some audience questions. So I want to mention that uh, right from the get-go, there's a Q&A box that you can submit them to at the bottom. So uh, please do. Uh, it could be any time throughout this uh, when anyone's talking, and, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so uh, I'm just going to start things off here. Um, this uh, panel, of course, uh, is about uh, direct-to-consumer alcohol shipping. Uh, we, uh, I think, have all varying types of, of uh, people with different levels of, of knowledge about DTC, uh, short for direct to consumer. Uh, so I wanted to just quickly start by introducing uh, what uh, DTC is for anyone that, that may be unaware. Uh, some of you may be very aware, of course, uh, but direct to consumer uh, shipping uh, is uh, the shorthand that's often used for the delivery of alcohol directly to consumers, um, fairly self-explanatory. People often use it in the context of the producer, a brewer, distiller, winery, delivering, delivering directly to a consumer's home. Um, sometimes it's used to connote a retailer uh, delivering uh, to a consumer's home. Um, and one of the kind of key uh, issues that comes up with it is the shipment specifically across state lines from one state to another. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of that uh, today, but uh, people are often, when they say DTC, are referring to direct-to-consumer shipment uh, interstate across uh, state lines. Uh, so it's just important to mention that because there's a lot of different alcohol delivery that's been going on uh, in our uh, our new normal of uh, of COVID nineteen. There's to go cocktails. There's uh, you know local um, getting a growler delivered from your brewery, um, and that's uh, not exactly what we're talking about today. We're talking more specifically about uh, the shipment um, and and usually uh, across state lines. Again, we'll get into more details of that, but I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page uh, here. Um, we also wanted to mention kind of why we're, we're doing this um, and, and talking about this. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the COVID-19 global pandemic has upended alcohol world. It has made alcohol delivery much more of a priority among policymakers and lawmakers. Uh, and in fact, actually, the uh, TTB uh, came out with a big report on competition in the alcohol space. Uh, they're talking about direct consumer shipping. They actually urged state legislatures to uh, think about passing a, a DTC law. Um, and so we uh, think it's a really timely subject um, and why we're really excited to talk about some of the legal and policy ins and outs uh, of it uh, today. Um, one other thing to keep in mind um, is that uh, DTC wine shipments, again, this might be you know, very familiar ground for a lot of people uh, on, on this, uh, uh, listening into this event, um, but uh, wine shipments, almost every state now, it's well over 40, allow DTC uh, wine shipments uh, to consumers in the state from wineries uh, in and out of state. It's much less common with beer and distilled spirits. Uh, it's actually below a dozen um, or around a dozen uh, for, for each of those. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, retailers shipping across state lines, much less than you see uh, in, in the wine space for wineries. Uh, so when we're talking about it expanding today, we're gonna be talking a lot about these other spirit categories or um, uh, other uh, stakeholders uh, besides uh, wineries. That being said, the wine uh, experience of DTC, I think, can inform a lot of policy moving forward when it comes to expanding DTC. And we actually released today at R Street uh, a paper that uh, empirically uh, studies um, the history of direct-to-consumer wine shipment. One of the big pushbacks or worries about DTC and delivery alcohol generally is it getting delivered to underage uh, uh, folks. Um, and so we actually empirically looked at whether DTC wine 
uh, uh, did raise, or there's any evidence of it raising underage drinking rates uh, over the last several decades. And, and we found that it did not. Um, uh, we actually put that in the uh, chat uh, box. We released that paper today and also a, a shorter form piece uh, explaining some of our research on it. Um, and we'll talk more today about some of the arguments for and against DTC, but um, we wanted to kind of set that groundwork for us today so we all can be on the same page um, and, uh, and be able to uh, have a good discussion. So uh, without further ado, I will briefly introduce our panelists and then I will let them uh, each uh, give a brief overview on a couple of different topics. And then uh, I'll probably ask some questions. And once again, throughout this, please feel free to submit uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll get to as many of them as we can uh, at the end. Uh, so uh, for our panelists, um, first I will uh, introduce um, uh, Sean O'Leary. Uh, he is known as the Irish uh, liquor lawyer. He is a leader in advocating uh, for uh, DTC shipping and modernizing the liquor uh, industry generally. Sean's uh, defended um, a lot of complex DTC shipping models um, in front of state regulatory agencies. He's helped set up DTC shipping models. Uh, he's advocated for modernization um, and he's drafted uh, numerous US Supreme Court briefs advocating for expanding DTC shipping. And he actually started a grassroots effort uh, that led to the first cocktails to go law in Illinois, which is uh, pretty cool. And uh, of course, um, as many of you may know, he also frequently provides a lot of expert analysis and commentary on alcohol law topics on his popular website, uh, Irish uh, Liquor Lawyer. Uh, Bob uh, Epstein, I'll introduce uh, next. Uh, he is no, <clears throat> excuse me, he is known as the wine litigator. Uh, and if it seems like we have a uh, Marvel Comics uh, book movie of uh, cool uh, alcohol policy names. Uh, I, I think we do between the Irish liquor lawyer and the wine uh, lit <coughs> litigator, excuse me. Um, but Bob is an attorney who specialized in a variety of areas of law, including uh, media law, immigration, uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, and of course, constitutional uh, and wine law. Uh, his uh, kind of current interest for the past 15 years has been in the area of wine law and wine litigation. And uh, he was the first American uh, attorney to file a, a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of state laws that prohibited the shipment of wine across state lines. Uh, in this case, of course, was the Granholm versus Heald case uh, decided uh, in 2005 at the U.S. Supreme Court. And it is really considered a, a landmark case uh, in both alcohol and constitutional law. Uh, and then finally, uh, Representative uh, Koenig, um, uh, he was elected to the Kentucky State House of Representatives uh, in November of 2006, and he's the chairman of their Licensing, Occupations, and Administrative Regulations Committee, and also serves on the Banking, Insurance, and Local Government Committee there. And in 2002, uh, Chairman Koenig uh, passed uh, HB 415, which we'll be talking about today, which is really a trailblazing bill providing for direct consumer shipment of alcohol uh, in Kentucky and provides a model of sorts um, that I think states can look to uh, moving forward. Um, so as uh, you can imagine, we're gonna kind of be talking about DTC kind of through two lenses or prongs, if you will, of, of litigation and legislation. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, first here with Sean to give kind of a, a brief, overview of both some of the arguments for and against direct consumer shipping and also um, just a little bit of a, a discussion about some of the recent state level activity we've seen in, in the legislature uh, about it. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over uh, to you, uh, Sean. Um, I see that uh, we've had someone uh, raise a hand, by the way. Um, there's no way for us to directly interact. So if you have a question, just please submit it through the Q&A box. Um, Sean, uh, I, will, uh, I will go over to you. Thank you, Jared. Good to be here, everybody. Jared, I think the first issue we have to look at even before we get into the arguments for and against is why direct-to-consumer shipping is so important. And when you look at the post grand home world in 2005, which is basically the case that allowed direct-to-consumer shipping to become a wide range across the country, 
the amount of wineries is basically doubled and there's a lot more wineries than distill distilleries in the US. And one of the reasons is because they can get access to markets they would otherwise not without direct to consumer shipping. If you're a small winery in Illinois and you wanna to ship to Oregon or New Jersey or New Mexico, you don't have enough concentrated demands in the States to make it worthwhile to go through the wholesale network. So what really occurs then is that the direct to consumer uh, shipping market allows you access to markets you'd be shut off in. And since we have 50 states, you can build a good mass qual quantity of product being shipped. And it's a difference between an expanding business and one that's constricted. And it's also the difference between a business actually being able to enter a marketplace and to be attractive to enter a marketplace. Now let's talk about some of the arguments for direct, direct to consumer shipping and those against. And let's be honest, we're not regulating socks and diapers. We're regulating a consumer good that needs a strict regulatory environment. And three of the major concerns I've seen with direct to consumer shipping have been obviously the first, as we mentioned, is minors getting access to alcohol. Uh, two, that this does not lead to overconsumption in the population in a highly unregulated market. And three, that the taxes are paid so we can support our regulatory market. Now in 2005 in Granholm, the Supreme Court indicated that the direct to consumer uh, sh shipping world was not causing uh, mass amounts of underage drinkers to get their hands on the alcohol. They haven't seen the evidence of this. And I haven't seen your paper yet, Jared, but I would assume it's showing the same thing. Now, I represent a lot of direct-to-consumer shipping companies, and the technology has increased tenfold since 2005. There's traceability from the time the product is bought to the time it's delivered and who signed for it and who it was delivered to. Now, remember, a lot of the direct-to-consumer shipping is done by UPS and FedEx, which are publicly traded companies which train their employees to, to do this job properly. If someone doesn't do it properly, they could lose a high paying job that would be hard to replace. So the fact is the system is working with underage drinking. It's not perfect, <laughs> but it's, it's working very well. Uh, the other issues with tax and, um, and overconsumption, not that I'm for personal uh, shipping limits, but at least it's a, something they could utilize as a compromise. And the taxes can be shown through the system, which is audible and very traceable. Selling a brick and mortars and finding going through an audit is a lot harder than do it for someone that ships DTC. Now, the problem I see with the regulatory market today is we're not utilizing regulatory justifications, which are succinct issues that should be brought up and are important. Instead of bringing them up and say, how can we work in a framework to expand the market and get access to capital in the market, we're utilizing these as a barrier to entry. And I don't know how many clients I've had that said, you know, Sean, if we could get more, uh, if we could get better winery or distillery shipping laws, we could expand our operations. We could raise more capital. We could hire more people. Really what is working is, is a barrier to entry. And the wholesalers and their allies really seem to present problems and not solutions to this issue. Now, to give you an example how the system has worked. So in, um, in March 2020, I was considered a radical because I went to the Illinois Liquor Control Commission and said, we need to legalize cocktails to go. And there were great regulatory concerns, which were legitimate brought up by the agency, right? This could lead to access uh, to uh, uh, underage drinking. This could lead to drunk driving because people could have a cocktail in the car, sipping it and driving, and it could lead to a more unfettered access in the marketplace. What we did is we worked with the legislature and addressed the Liquor Commission's concerns. I sat down with the state senator and we addressed the concerns and where they had issues with where the liquor's placed and uh, other different regulatory issues. We drafted a bill that nearly unanimously passed the Illinois House and Senate. In a, in a, in a, in a precarious political environment in Illinois, that's almost impossible to do. But what it shows 
is that things have to be worked through and the regulatory issues need to be brought to the table, but not brought to the table to keep people out of the marketplace, but brought to the pay table to be able to expand access. And let's not forget the consumers who oftentimes desire to have greater demand than what their distribution networks in their states can afford to them. They want to basically have this, so we're also cheating the consumers. Now, when we look at what's going on at the state level, what we're seeing is a hunger since COVID for more direct-to-consumer shipping. And California is a perfect example of this. In COVID, California legalized direct-to-consumer shipping for spirits producers on a temporary basis. The reason why is their tasting rooms were shut down and they needed another form of income to survive. And a lot of this income, whether it's cocktails to go or be able to have direct-to-consumer shipping, actually helps businesses to survive. And it's the difference between businesses being put out of businesses and, and those expanding and growing. Now, the wholesalers and their allies have obviously uh, you know, opposed this new direct-to-consumer shipping bill in California. And the Teamsters went out and talked about how miners are gonna get their hands on alcohol, how um, this will lead to people losing their jobs, small retailers, uh, how Teamsters would lose their jobs, and these big multi-state corporations would end up ruling, ruling California. Uh, it's almost like out of the Bernie Sanders playbook here. And, you know, wh when I looked at the, the law, um, all of a sudden it passed through the House, in, uh, the House in California, and it's going to the Senate. But then all of a sudden the Teamsters have now uh, dropped their opposition. But it was, it's with a caveat. 150,000 gallon per producers are the only and under are the only ones that could access that marketplace. Now, the Teamsters finding religion somehow, um, I guess, made the thing of miners getting their hands on alcohol go away. Uh, somehow, retailers aren't going to lose jobs and the Teamsters aren't going to lose jobs because it's limited. Now, uh, UPS is the biggest employer of Teamsters in the US. Uh, employs 25% of the Teamsters, and they would grow through direct-to-consumer shipping. So the evidence that's brought out, I think the opposite is actually shown oftentimes. Now, people may ask, why do we care about the 150,000 gallon production limit producers? Isn't the uh, whole thing about allowing small people to access markets where they can't have concentrated demand? I mean, these guys could be part of the distribution network. The pro there's a couple of problems. One, production limits don't work and they don't work in the wine industry. They either, either get overturned by courts or states come to the wisdom that they don't work. Only New Jersey has a requirement. The other is consumers demand access to these products and shutting them out and putting a barrier to entry to people is not allowing the consumer to get the access they want to the marketplace. The other thing is there's a legitimate reason why a company like Beam would want to get in the direct-to-consumer market. Suppose Beam wanted to come up with a pumpkin spice latte bourbon, right? And they wanted to experiment with some crazy flavor. We don't know if it's going to sell through the uh, distribution system, but if we're able to test market it through the uh, direct-to-consumer system, it allows people to have access and allows th uh, things to see if they're working. And finally, on my last two points, what is the states are really hurting the consumer in this. You hear uh, the Michigan Attorney General put out these reports and talk about a third of the shipments coming in are illegal. What she is not saying is that a third of the shipments are stuff people that want that we don't license and don't get the tax money off. And finally, my last point is we need to change the marketplace. It needs to go from not having regulatory concerns that block people out but regulatory concerns that are meshed in the law and open markets and increase access for people. Thank you. Great, Thank, thanks, Sean, for that great overview of, of, of some of the uh, impulses uh, going on and also some of the, the state battles and how they're playing out. Um, now I'd like to go to uh, Bob um, to give us a little bit of a overview in, in five to 10 minutes here of some of the litigation, which is kind of the other 
prong of this that's that's going on um, in addition to some of the state uh, legislative uh, work. So, um, Bob, uh, I know you're uh, uh, expert and involved in a lot of these cases. So could you give us a, a brief overview of them, please? Sure, thank you. And uh, welcome to all of you in the audience, including uh, the few wholesalers that may be listening in as well. Uh, just a very quick note, <clears throat> uh, Jared said that I've been at this for 15 years. Actually, we filed the first DTC case 24 years ago. The reason was that I used to be the uh, wine journalist for the Indianapolis Star, and I was supplanted by Russ Breidenbaugh, also a lawyer. And he called me one day and said, Bob, they passed this terrible felony statute. I can't get my samples. I can't write my articles anymore. Would you take on the case? So that was the first case we filed. And that ended up in Granholm, which was decide, argued on November, excuse me, December 7th, uh, 2004, and decided in May of 2005. Um, after that, uh, the amount of wineries that allowed DTC expanded from about four to now I think we're up to 46. So the next stage was retail direct to consumer shipping. Currently, there are, however you want to count it, 14 or 15 plus the D.C., District of Columbia, that do allow out-of-state direct-to-consumer shipping. And our goal as free traders is to expand that to basically allow every state in the union to allow uh, retail direct-to-consumer shipping. There is a bit of a mis misnomer here in that uh, the argument has been made by the states and the wholesalers that there are maybe 400,000 retail licensees. That is true. However, there are only about less than 2,000 retailers that really engage in internet sales of, uh, of wine uh, DTC. So having said that, let me give you an update on litigation. Uh, <clears throat> my home state is Indiana. So we argued uh, on December the 10th of two, uh, 2021 uh, in the Seventh Circuit. And as we sit here, we're waiting for the decision to come down. Uh, it could come down tomorrow. It could come down in the next month or two. Uh, interestingly enough, Judge Easterbrook was on the panel uh, who has quite a background in wine litigation. Uh, he argued the Bacchus case a long time ago. And uh, so we'll see. He treated us rather well. And uh, it was an interesting panel. So we'll see what comes down there. Uh, in Illinois, uh, we call it Illinois 1 and Illinois 2. Uh, <clears throat> Illinois 1 was Lebemoff, uh, and we, uh, we had a 94-year-old federal judge that wanted to try the case rather than to hear it as a summary judgment. And it, it lingered for almost five years without actually getting to trial. It was finally uh, set for trial, and lo and behold, uh, First of all, Lebemoff, who was the plaintiff, Lebemoff Enterprises, Cap and Cork from Fort Wayne, was sold, so we lost standing. And the second thing that happened was, for whatever reason, there was a change of judge at the last minute. So what we did, we dismissed the case. We have refiled in the Central District of Illinois uh, in, uh, in Springfield, and there was a pending motion on venue. And the, uh, the attorney general and the wholesalers want to venue that back to Chicago, and we would just as soon have it heard in the central district. So that's just pending. We don't know what's going to happen there. Then we have North Carolina in the Fourth Circuit. <clears throat> that was argued uh, about six weeks ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me have a sip here. That was argued... Uh, about six weeks ago, and um, we don't know how that's going to come out. Uh, there is good precedent in the Fourth Circuit in the Beskin case, which was the winery case that we argued in, in one uh, quite some time ago that had kind of an interesting uh, result. So we'll see whether uh, the Fourth Circuit adopts the, uh, the previous uh, rationale of the Pe Beskin case or goes another way. Uh, then we have Ohio. Uh, Ohio is in the Sixth Circuit, the same as was Michigan, and I'll get to Michigan in a bit. 
So we have uh, we had three cases in the Sixth Circuit. We had Michigan, where we won at the district court level, and then it was appealed by Michigan to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it was uh, reversed. Um, my my reasoning on what happened with the reversal was that the judge that wrote the opinion was in the minority of the underlying district court case in Tennessee wine. And um, he got his Montezuma's revenge uh, in the Sixth Circuit with us, where he found uh, uh, some theories that uh, we think are not appropriate, but yet we're stuck with that decision. And of course, that's being used in other cases as well by the states and the wholesalers, that opinion. Um, so Ohio, again, we have uh, pretty well fully briefed uh, uh, Ohio. In fact, I just uh, uh, reread a brief this morning that's going to be filed Friday in Ohio. Uh, I think that'll be argued in, at the district court level within, oh, maybe a month or two. Uh, so it's only at the district court level. Most recent case we filed was in Arizona, and that is beginning to percolate as well. Um, the wholesalers, of course, have uh, uh, become involved in that along with the with the state. Um, but it's really early to tell what's going to happen in Arizona. Another case that is well along is Rhode Island. Uh, we now have cross motions for summary judgment filed by us and by the other side. Um, we have a very good judge there. Uh, I expect that he will call for oral argument probably within two or three months, and we shall see what happens there. Uh, then we have uh, New Jersey, um, where again, motions for summary judgment have been filed. Uh, there is still an ongoing dispute as to some discovery. Um, there is some indication, although I don't believe it's true, that this will be decided on the papers. I believe that it will be argued. I can't tell you when, but I would, I would expect within the next six months. And again, just as a total overview of all of these cases, they're founded in the same principle. That principle being that in-state retailers can sell, ship, and deliver wine to consumers within their state, but that out-of-state retailers cannot. That's the overriding principle in all of these cases. The last one is Florida. Uh, Florida, in terms of the winery case, was decided probably in 2008, 2009. It went up to the 11th Circuit twice, came back, and we won that case for wineries. We never litigated on retailers, uh, but we got an, an administrative opinion, which we authored uh, with, the, with the state saying that the retailers uh, from out of state should be allowed to ship directly to consumers in Florida, it was, it was approved. Then lo and behold, the attorney general within the last few months filed a, an appeal within the, with the same district court asking that uh, that administrative opinion be set aside, thus preventing out of state DTC in Florida. The, the judge, who happened to be the same judge we had in the winery case from Tampa, pretty much dismissed it out of hand. And to my great surprise, now mind you, there was a 16, hour, a 16 year delay between the decision in the winery case and the attempt by the uh, attorney general to set the administrative opinion aside, 16 years. They now have taken that back to the 11th Circuit. So as we're sitting here today, DTC is still permitted in Florida pending an opinion out of the 11th Circuit. So that is the status of uh, litigation. And you never know, there could be another one or two follow, to follow. Great, Bob. Yeah, just uh, before we go to Representative Kate, I guess I want to ask one really quick um, follow sure. up on that. Um, you know, if some of these cases start um, with these retailers start to come out, um, you know, 
in favor of, of, of essentially for to make it simple of, of, of uh, interstate uh, DTC shipment. Do you foresee that um, that will kind of continue the growth towards um, uh, maybe even litigation towards uh, states that are preventing brewers and distillers, for example, um, to also kind of have those DTC uh, abilities that now are restricted to wineries? Do you, do you foresee this kind of continuing to evolve in that direction? It, it very well could. And actually we've been, yes, it could. Now, one other thing, and I would challenge the wholesalers that they're listening in. We would like to see the Supreme Court to decide the retail DTC shipping once and for all. And uh, at this point, I know they've been opposing it. They don't want it to go to the Supreme Court, but that's really gonna be the answer. And if we get a, a good opinion one way or the other out of the Supreme Court, we'll know which way to go on these. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, now go to uh, Representative uh, Koenig. Um, and again, uh, he uh, was responsible for the uh, 2020 uh, DTC bill in Kentucky, which really was, was a landmark, um, in my opinion, kind of trailblazing uh, legislative effort at the state level to show how states uh, could uh, act through their legislative chambers, um, um, you know, uh, regardless of what was going on in, in, in the court, in the courtroom. So, um, Representative Koenig, uh, could you give us a, a little bit of an overview of, of what that was like, how it came about, some of the uh, opposition that you faced, and, and kind of ultimately how it, how it came, uh, came through on the other side and passed? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for having me, and, and thanks for all the participants who've Joined uh, the background on on this bill was uh, the only folks that were allowed to ship uh, in Kentucky were in state wineries, um, and which which were pretty much few and far between in Kentucky. Uh, small farm wineries is what what they were uh, called in statute. And in 2019, Senator Max Wise, who comes from a rural part of I call it South Central. Kentucky filed a bill in the Senate to allow for direct shipment of wine only and no restrictions. <clears throat> and um, that passed the Senate, came to us in the House. Now, um, uh, and I don't mean this in a partisan way, I'm just telling a story. When um, I'm a Republican, Republicans took over the Kentucky House of Representatives in 2016 for the first time in 95 years. And I've been chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction ever since. And one of my goals has always been to um, create a level playing field within tiers and across tiers, okay? Uh, for so long, you know, within each tier, producers of wine, uh, beer, spirits, all had different privileges. <clears throat> and my, my goal was to say, if al alcohol is alcohol. Uh, if one tier or one area of a tier has a privilege, everyone deserves that privilege. So, um, so when it came to us and, and we have, um, it was an odd number year, we have 30 legislative days in odd number years. We have 60 legislative days in even number years. So it, it came to us, it was late in session. Um, and our first concern was, A, it doesn't meet that criteria of, of uh, privileges within a tier. And also, for God's sakes, we're the world's capital of bourbon. We can't pass something that allows for shipment of wine and not bourbon. And if we're gonna do it for bourbon and wine, we're gonna do it for everybody. So we tried to see if we could fix that up, but A, it was too complex uh, in a short amount of time and B, um, to be perfectly honest, I don't think the sponsor would be upset with me if, if I told this. He was, at that time, of the opinion, I'm not entirely sure I can support spirits in my district, um, but wine, I think, is okay. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't move on it. <clears throat> uh, we talked to him about it, and he said, you all take the ball and run with it. So uh, myself, uh, the Speaker of the House, David Osborne, and our whip, a majority whip, uh, Chad McCoy, who happens to represent Bardstown. Um, three weeks after session ended, we convened everyone who, who was involved um, in 
uh, the alcohol industry. And we had our first of several meetings where everyone was in the same room. And we said, this is the plan. We're going to have a direct to consumer shipping bill and it's going to allow shipment of all sorts of alcohol. Um, and frankly, uh, many, many, many of the, uh, and it was my intent to allow all three tiers to ship. So producers, distributors, retailers, um, and make it equitable for everybody and figure out how to do it right. <clears throat> well, um, you know, fast forward. And the reason we got everybody into a room, I don't know what it's like in other states, but I know that, um, you know, some people have side conversations and, you know, start a fire over here and start a fire over there and say, this person said that and whatnot. And so anyway, um, when we got everybody in the same room, we said, save your piece here. Otherwise we don't want to hear. So I think that helped quite a bit. Another thing that really helped was um, uh, the year prior, we um, got um, Christy Trout Van Tatenhove, who was our ABC commissioner. Uh, she was hired to work for the Kentucky House of Representatives. She's a terrific lawyer in general, and obviously her background in alcohol was pivotal in helping me um, write the bill, get everybody together and do it in a way that made sense and um, was legal. So. You know, once we got into session, um, we made, you know, long story short, uh, I, I fought really, really hard to um, allow everyone to ship, but the retailers and the wholesalers insisted that they be taken out and not be allowed to ship, which stunned me. And I said in plenty of, out loud in plenty of meetings, you know, I'm, this seems like a good business opportunity. But the fact of the matter is they didn't want competition from uh, retailers and wholesalers outside of Kentucky um, to come in. So, and in the end, they ended up opposing it, uh, even though we made a ton of concessions for them. But now the law is that you can ship any sort of alcohol, uh, but you have to order it directly from the producer. So either on site or via a website. Um, it has to be sent by common carrier. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's been a, it was a lifeline. The timing was not pandemic related. It just happened to occur that way. But yeah, it was a lifeline for a lot of these, um, especially small wineries, breweries, um, you know, small <sighs> distilleries, which are popping up all over Kentucky and, you know, when you get a, you know, a review or an internet article about a new bourbon that's coming out, a new distillery, um, you had to, you know, hope that people remembered it. You had to get it into the system, get it into the stores. Now these, these individuals, if, if they have a website and they can take advantage of it immediately, just like any other business, just like any winery in, in Napa Valley or whatnot. And, uh, and I think that's important for a lot of these small businesses. Um, now, the, I get blamed by retailers for them not getting uh, the product that they want. Uh, we know that that's not the case, but um, you know, it, it's always been my opinion and retailers and wholesalers are never going anywhere. Uh, as I said plenty of times in, when describing this bill and with the arguments, you know, uh, it's not like Kroger's grows carrots out back and brings them into the front and sells them. You know, they're, they're not in that business. Um, we're always going to have retailers. We're always going to have wholesalers. We're always going to have producers. They want to do their thing and they don't, generally speaking, want to get in, into the other's business. Um but um, I think uh, the wholesalers are starting to regret not wanting, not, not being in to the uh, sales um, portion. Uh, and we had a cleanup bill the next year because the regs, um, the, the lobbying continued with the retailers and the wholesalers and some of the regulations, uh, we had to change the administration and uh, the regulations were um, not in 
um, accordance with what we, uh, I think, clearly said and certainly what we intended. So we had to clean up build and make it abundantly clear some of the things we wanted to do. And we also had to address the issue, as mentioned earlier, about samples, um, being allowed to ship those uh, for free uh, to members of the media and, and others who, who want to taste test. Um, but yeah, I, I, everyone seems to be happy with it. We've, we've had hundreds and hundreds of, of licenses sold, um, you know, at a hundred dollars, which, you know, some of the opponents wanted to make a thousand. And I, I was of the opinion, why don't we make it one dollar? Um, so we settled on a hundred, but, uh, my, my goal has always been to increase business, um, make it so that we can sell more products in Kentucky that consumers and I live in Northern Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati. And when I would tell people about this bill, when I was working on it to a person, the amount of people, everyone would say, you mean I can stop sending wine to my office in, in Ohio or to my in-laws in Indiana or something. And uh, that was money Kentucky was missing out on. It was going to other States for no good reason, in my opinion. Um, it wasn't helping the retailers. These are, these are things that people are, if they could buy it at their local retailer, they would. So um, I, I think it's been a great win. It's exciting to see that other states are, are using this as a model. And, um, you know, as a Kentuckian, I look forward to other states um, expanding the menu of things that can be shipped in so they can uh, have better access to our wonderful bourbon. Yeah, that's a great note to uh, end on there, um, uh, Representative Koenig. Um, one of the things that can get a little confusing that I also kind of just for clarity's sake wanted to mention is people talk about sometimes inbound and outbound uh, DTC states. Um, is it the state where the producer exists that needs to be the one that passes the law to allow it or the one where the consumer is? I think the generally accepted legal view is that uh, the state of the consumer um, is is uh, the relevant kind of uh, locus point for it. Um, so that's just uh, something that I thought I'd throw in there um, uh, to your point uh, at the end, Representative Koenig. Um, we've uh, gotten some uh, a lot of questions uh, so far, which is uh, great. I'd like to try to get to uh, some of them. People are welcome to keep um, submitting uh, questions um, if they would like. Uh, we'll take um, a remaining time here to, uh, to try to... Uh, to try to have a little uh, uh, more discussion here. Um, uh, one um, thing I've, uh, a couple of the questions uh, were concerned about um, the uh, potential uh, impact, again, that you alluded to this, Sean, of um, uh, local retailers, small retailers being hurt if uh, producers from out of state or retailers out of state could ship uh, into uh, a state um, and, and also uh, some concern around um, what would be the way in which the excise uh, taxes for a state, for example, would be tracked and would they actually really be paid by kind of the out-of-state shippers. Um, Sean, did you have a, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Again, you alluded to it, um, kind of what that uh, mechanism would look like um, and if you, you see that as a, as a concern. So a couple of things, and, and uh, Representative Koenig spoke to this too about retailers saying they're getting hurt, but you know we have a track record. There's 16 states that allow direct-to-consumer wine retailer shipping, and the uh, product coming into the state, has a, we haven't seen any justified evidence that it's led to a decrease in retailers or put retailers out of business. Now, with the collecting of taxes, the systems are audible and traceable online. So if a state wants to go into a direct-to-consumer shipper, shipper, and representative could speak to this, when you look at it, they have to have audible records. And in state, legis uh, state legislation, they will discuss that they have the right and the ability to audit you pursuant to their license. So the records have to be there, just like anyone who would be in state. Now, I think it's probably uh, the argument could be made that it's easier to audit these people because they have electronic records versus brick and mortars who sometimes not every brick and mortar has advanced records. So <laughs> with tax collection, I think the regulatory concerns, although justified, have been, you know, 
have been <coughs> mitigated with the advance of technology. Uh, Chair, may I make one further comment yes, on this? Please do. Uh, I'm going to make a distinction between the collection of excise and sales tax. Typ typically, excise tax is paid in the state of origin. In other words, in DTC, if a, uh, the excise tax would be paid from the out of state to that state's treasury. Sales tax, on the other hand, could be collected for a shipment from one state to another. Now, we've run into a situation where a state has said, would you, uh, as a condition of getting a, the ability to uh, ship from out of state here, also pay double excise tax? The answer is probably yes, because it's a very small amount. But we have run into that. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good clarification there. Um, thank you. Um, uh, we uh, had a, another question about, um, you know, some of the other states that have been considering DTC legislation. We had mentioned uh, uh, California, of course, it's kind of been an ongoing focus. Representative Kandig, um, do you, is there any kind of like buzz or people that have approached you over the last couple of years from other states that have, um, uh, you know, had interest in this? Um, have you kind of, do you think it's attracted some attention, I guess, outside the state of Kentucky? It has. Um, I've talked to um, a, a legislator or two from other states, but really our uh, Kentucky Distillers Association has really made the push in a lot of these other states to encourage um, <clears throat> folks to um, do this. And, and I think Discus has done, done that as well. Um, but, you know, it makes sense for places like Texas who has you know, a, a large um, um, still <laughs> group uh, for tequila uh, and probably other things uh, where it might make sense for them to, to do it. Um, so I, I, I'm always happy to help, especially legislators uh, <clears throat> to expand it. Um, I don't know how many states will be excited about shipping in new products uh, and spirits when they don't have as many spirits to ship out. Um, but, you know, it gives your, your constituents more choice. And I think that's one of the main selling points that needs to happen is it's not about you. It's not about your business necessarily. It's about giving your, your constituents the ability to order something that they would like to get and maybe ordering illegally and having shipped, uh, you know, let them have the option, let them collect collect the taxes and make sure that you know what what's coming in and what's coming out. Absolutely. Um, one question that I've had posed to me a lot that I would like to um, get some weigh in from, um, you know, both Sean and, and, and Bob, um, legally, I'm not asking politically because everyone knows that not much is happening in the federal level, but legally, what role, if any, would potentially Congress have to legislate um, under the Commerce Clause some version of a federal um, DTC legislation? Um, again, I'm not asking whether that's particularly likely to happen in the next five years, more just what would what would be the legal arguments for and against them being able to do that? We can start with Sean if we want. Bob, you're, you're welcome to weigh in as well. Well, uh, you know, we, we can't have it both ways. A lot of people like going to Congress, right? We have the 21st Amendment Enforcement Act was the last thing passed by Congress. But if the 21st Amendment's about states be able to exercise authority in their jurisdiction, right? And it's pretty much like think of 50 different fences around the economies. And the states utilize these justifications to deny our friend Bob Epstein the, the right to win his cases. So, you know, we, we need to see really what the balance is, right? Do we have a 21st Amendment, really, when we're going to Congress when we don't like the result and telling them, go pass legislation so we get what we want? Now, under the Commerce Clause, it's, it's interesting, right? Because um, according to the cases, we have, especially um, with the wide retail shipping cases going in, we don't, haven't had a definitive answer on what observes what, right? Whether it's the Commerce Clause or the 21st Amendment. Usually the 21st Amendment loses the constitutional amendments like the 1st, the 14th, the Import-Export Clause, right? So 
Um, what they could pass is they could put uh, federal regulation via co congressional legislation, but it, uh, to me, it seems kind of odd. I think I would like to see the Fed stay out of it. Hey, let me let me uh, chime in there. Uh, just to follow up on what Sean said, in terms of <clears throat> uh, this type of litigation, the, the principle when you balance the 21st Amendment and the Commerce Clause is the 21st Amendment survives, but for discrimination. In other words, if you can show discrimination, then you can trump the 21st Amendment. Now, what would be the rationale for <clears throat> Congress to take on uh, DTC and pass legislation. If we go back to the Federalist Papers where Hamilton talked about national unity and the concept of the Commerce Clause was the expansion of trade, not the lessening of trade. That would be the rationale. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that uh, we've had um, some interest in some questions on um, is exploring. Um, and Sean, you you spoke a little bit to this, and Representative Kading maybe you as well at the Kentucky uh, experience. Um, you mentioned uh, Sean how a lot of the uh, larger distilleries might be interested, in especially your premium products or more limited offerings through uh, DTC. Um, one question that we got was kind of what. What limits or what kind of uh, regulations do you think would make sense uh, in, in a DTC bill? I know you're probably more on the pro reform side uh, of it or liberalization side of it, but uh, is, there, is there specific things that you think uh, uh, might make sense? Let's start with you, Sean. Well, you know, I, I've never been a fan of uh, limits uh, oftentimes, right? They're, they become arbitrary. And to be honest, if I wanted to go to the uh, local liquor store and buy out the whole shelf of Blue Nun, which I don't drink, but suppose I wanted to, no, no one would stop me, right? There's, there's no temperance issue. So if I want to order it from a different method, why should I be stopped from doing it? Uh, you know, uh, but a lot of this in reality, and uh, the rep representative can speak to it, a lot of this does come down to compromise, right? And you end up getting limits on the amount people can order and consume, right? So they can only order two cases per month from uh, a specific distiller. And that's done to address the issue of overconsumption. So uh, politically, I, I think that's kind of a compromise you see, but what I don't like is a compromise of we're gonna limit the, uh, amount, the, the people that can get access to the marketplace by putting in a production limit. Yeah, we had a put in as a compromise, a limit to what you can order. Um, and, you know, the fact of the matter is you're just encouraging people to go to their neighbors or, and have them order more if that's what they want, or send it to your office in Ohio or something like that. <clears throat> Doesn't make any sense if you want to ship a hundred, you know, um, cases of wine to your house, why is government getting in the way of that? As long as it's a legal product you're being used in a legal way um, and you're not taking it to a retail outlet and, and reselling it. So, um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, as Sean said, are done via um, compromise. And, you know, there was <clears throat> obviously people heard a lot on my bill from retailers saying that this was gonna be the end of the world. And, and that's one of those things where in order to get it passed, you have to be able to go to your fellow legislators and say, look, I gave the retailers A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and they're still against it. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at which point they say, okay, you've, you've, you've done your duty, you've tried to get them on board. And now I feel a lot comfortable I can vote for it. So that's also part of the process. Yeah. Yeah, we got uh, one interesting question that, that, that a little bit in the weeds. We, we don't have someone who's who's a um, state regulator on uh, this webinar. Um, so I don't know if we'll have anyone that'll have a direct experience with it, but we might. So I'm 
I'm going to, I'm going to ask it. It, it is interesting. It's something I've seen. There's been kind of this advent of um, online kind of platforms that will uh, tell producers that they can kind of sell their product nationwide and be three tier kind of compliant or whatever. Um, uh, is that something that you've uh, uh, ran across um, or, or, or thought about at all, Sean? I know you've blogged on a lot of different topics, so maybe you'd be the person to, to start with with that. Um, and, and you, I mean, for me, that would be somewhat of an argument to uh, get a legal uh, structure and system in place to make sure that the people that are doing interstate shipments are doing it the right way. Um, but but if you ran across that uh, uh, at all or, or have any thoughts on it, uh, I, I think you heard. Sean used to be a state regulator. Yeah, there so we go. That's true. So, um, you, you know, I think you're, and I, and I think the representative and Bob has seen this too. Um, what glitters is not always gold, right? People read something and they they believe something, and this is how the model works. And really, they may be mistaken that there's more to it than that. So, I I, I can't necessarily. I'm a state regulator. Now I'm going to give a, po a political answer, right? I can't necessarily opine on it because, um, you know, s someone has to come with a concrete example with something and be able to say, this is what I think, right? Because sometimes people draw assumptions on something and they end up being wrong when they look and the nuts and bolts of how it works legally. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had uh, one other um question on uh, European producers um, uh, having, um, if, if what we're talking about implicates them. We've been talking here in the domestic sphere. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, import issues that would be implicated um, when you start talking about international uh, uh, producers um, or, or retailers. Um, certainly, uh, I wish that it was easier to get uh, some of the wonderful spirits I've, I've tasted, for example, uh, in Europe uh, over here, but oftentimes um, uh, it's it's very difficult and they have to go through um, uh, a, a lot of hoops and hurdles themselves, which gets into uh, a lot of import laws uh, as well. So I just wanted to quickly touch on that for a, uh, for a clarity uh, issue. Um, we're coming to the uh, end of our time uh, here. Um, and uh, we, we had, as I said, many questions, weren't able to get to all of them, um, but we did, uh, I think, get to at least a, a good portion of them. So uh, we wanted to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, again for being a part of this uh, event. This event uh, will uh, and has been recorded and we will actually be posting it uh, on uh, YouTube, um, which you can find on the R Street YouTube channel or uh, on rstreet.org. Uh, we will uh, uh, be having uh, that out hopefully in the next uh, day or two. Uh, so um, if anyone missed it and you want to share it uh, with them, uh, you certainly can. Um, again, we uh, appreciate uh, everyone uh, watching this. Thank you again to the uh, panelists, and uh, we hope that uh, you all have a, a good day. Thank you much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.